when you're beat up and things hurt and joints hurt and you're even potentially bruised in places, I actually just want to get you moving. I don't really even care how much weight there is that first day back, but we're going to get some reps in and we're going to get some blood pumped in because you, my goal at the end of session one and session two after a meet is to actually feel better. You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Scott Hambrick. That's Matt Reynolds there. And, and, there's been noise on the internet in the last couple of weeks about the Barbell Logic rebranding, and we thought we would take a little bit of time to to talk about that. I want to tell a story first, though, Matt. Yes. I wrote a little guest column in the Tulsa World for a little while, the news, our local paper, mm-hmm. and it was about small business stuff, and it was about what we what I did for a living. And I would write the thing up, and I would send it in on, I think I sent it in on Wednesdays, and they published it on Fridays. And I, I only did like three or four of them. And I wrote it myself, and I had an agreement with them, and they had a major error of fact in every single one of them. Like, hmm. at, the, like at the bottom, it would say, Scott Hambrick's a small business owner. He's owned data storage for this many years. If you have any questions, you can email him at or call him at. And they would get my email wrong. <laughs> right. or, or they would get my phone wrong. Right. And I wrote the thing and sent it to him, you know, and I talked to the editor of the little small, the business section of the paper, you know, and knew who they got. And the internet is worse than that. Oh, yeah. Far worse. So, uh, so guys, you're seeing stuff on the internet. Listen, one, probably ain't right. Two, yeah. ain't none of your business. We're going to keep getting people stronger and putting them under the barbell. Um, so, so here's the, be- the, the meat of the thing. It's going to be Barbell Logic Online Coaching now. Uh, we're just, it's a rebranding. Uh, when I sold my business, it used to be data storage. It was data storage for 41 years. And uh, it's now Vital Record Center of Oklahoma. <laughs> They're taking care of clients it? and yeah. uh, cash and checks and rendering service. I bought a competitor back in uh, 2008. It was American Document Imaging. Rebranded it. Took care of their customers. Employees kept working. Everybody kept getting service. And, uh, but when I bought those com- when I bought American Document Imaging and when Vital Record Centers bought my company, uh, we needed to rebrand so that, well, it reflected the culture of what was going on. It reflected our goals uh, and it reflected the new company, Vital Record Centers' goals. And uh, this is not uncommon in the small business world. And, you know, The people at American Document Imaging, when I bought them, probably weren't terribly, the employees there probably weren't terribly happy. There's always a little bit of uh, heartbreak, and uh, people don't like change, and uh, people speculate as to what's going on. But at the core, it's about making sure that the brand aligns with the values. It's time to kind of make sure that this brand aligns with Matt's values. You've heard him talk about it time and time again. We even have a show called What Matt Values. Yep. And that's what this that's what this is about. Yeah, we've done the same thing for the business as well, right? We've got podcasts and articles about our core values at Barbell Logic and what we're trying to do. Um, and and really, it comes down to for us, it comes down to the people. We're a service company. Uh, we produce a lot of content, but the content is to help drive the service and to help uh, resonate and create relationships with people. We're trying to do what's best for our staff, our clients. Um, our listeners. Yeah. By rebranding, you can be you and we can be us. And uh, they think can organically be an expression of your values and the values of the coaches here. And people keep getting stronger, man. Yeah. Nothing changes about the service at all. Like the service is exactly the same, uh, exact same people, exact same credentials, exact same, like all of these things are the same. Um, Nothing changes whatsoever to our clients. If you're part of the the Barbell Logic online coaching community, you'll notice that the only thing that's different is the the header, the the title of the company at the top of the page. That's it. Everything else is the same. And there's a happy coincidence. Instead of it being, uh, uh, instead of the old acronyms, it's now BLOC, which happily turns out to be block. So I know, right? So it's like, isn't it amazing for, uh, for how uh, anti-communism I am? Uh, 
those guys produce some amazing athletes. So, uh, so we're gonna we're gonna train you like we're communists, but we're gonna res- we're gonna react in free market economy, sort of uh, <laughs> you know, business, small business world. That's right. Yeah. So what we're left with is, man, we're just super excited for the future. We've been excited about the future for a long time. This business has grown like crazy over the last several years. And the reason that's important to us is that as the business grows, it means we're affecting more lives in a positive way, um, whether that's through our content or through our online coaching or outstanding expert coaches or the academy in helping um, educate and make new coaches. And we are ecstatic about looking forward to the future and, and we're not worried too much about the past. And, uh, and we're just we're just focusing on all the good things that will come both to the business, um, to our staff, to our clients, to our future clients, the people who are listening now who will be clients in another year or two. We're excited about the growth that is to come. And so it's fun for us to uh, to move into this new season. So thank you guys for listening to us and being a part of it. And and uh, we're honored that you let us into your lives every single week. Yeah, man. Episode 200 is coming around the corner. It's nuts. Crazy. So, yeah, let's talk about deloads. Let's talk about deloads. <laughs> You are deloading this week. Yeah. Uh, you you have pretty much set PRs across the board. You have set PRs have. across the board. I have. On every single lift in the last uh, two and a half weeks, somewhere in that ballpark. And uh, I knew I could tell it's deload time. Like you're, everything aches and hurts and, you know, you're old. And so I said, hey, we're, we're going to do a deload next week. I said that last week. So now it's this week. And now you're in the middle of deload week. And you're like, oh, boy. Yeah, I think right, you texted this is me. Be awesome. I think you texted me and said, "Hey, I'm going to deload you next week." And in my head, I thought, "Good, perfect." And then Monday, and first workout, uh, you're squatting three fifteen for sets of five. Yeah, three fifteen for sets of five. And then I pulled three sixty five for three sets of five, and it's a deload week. Yeah. I'm like, and you're what? pulling four oh five for five. Did you do that yesterday or is that today? You actually, so, had me pull up for a triple. Um, wait, are you sure? I guess yeah. where I had you pull up for. Okay, so so the, yeah, so the. A 315 squat for reps and a 405 deadlift for reps has never been what you would consider a deload. No. And now it is. And now it is. And why? Well, I mean, my my top numbers continue to ascend uh, slowly but surely. And what was a warm, what was, you know, work sets are now warm ups, you know. And yeah. uh, I opened up the app on Monday, True Coach, to see the programming. And I saw those numbers. I'm like, God, you know, that's not a deload. I was like, I was dejected and then I went out and put the weight on the bar and actually did the 315 you know and it was work my father-in-law yep. Todd he's like that ain't heavy it's just a lot of work yeah and and at this point that's what that is yeah and uh, you know I know McKay's called me yelling about it and, and you yeah. yelling about the same thing you know he got a 605 deadlift so his you know his uh, his deloads might be uh, you know a, a set of five, five for four, right, for, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Way, way up in the four hundreds, and um, that's hard to get used to. And if yeah. you're programming for yourself, if you're programming for yourself, you would almost certainly uh, deload too much and maybe detrain. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to talk about that I don't know that anybody I've ever heard anybody talk about this. And we're going to have to grind them up and make hamburger, Matt. <laughs> I'm going to grind you up and make hamburger. If listen, <laughs> if you don't coming. come back stronger another week, that's it. That's <laughs> you're yeah. You got you're going to the grinder. Mm. Um, here's something I don't think anybody has ever verbalized. I, I know I've never verbalized it. I've thought it in my head, but but I was thinking about this before doing the show. So you are currently doing this week what I would call a normal standard deload, which is the goal is in general, what I'm going to do is reduce the stress enough to let fatigue dissipate, but not detrain. Right. That's the goal, right? So the way I do that and the way almost everybody does that. So uh, even people who usually program different than us, kind of prototypical powerlifting programmers and whatnot, uh, they're going to tend to keep the weight relatively heavy and they're gonna, so they're going to back off the intensity a little bit. So how much do we back off the intensity? Man, I don't know, like 15%-ish, 10% to 20%, yeah. somewhere in there. 25 is too much. And they're going to back the volume off tremendously. So the volume back off is usually like 50%. Now, sometimes it depends if you, a guy like you, has continued over the last several weeks to do really, really heavy and really, really low volume, then I might actually increase your volume a little bit and decrease your intensity a little more in order to start working that volume back up. But here's the crazy thing that I don't think has been verbalized. My goal for you is to come back next week and actually be as strong or stronger than you were last week. 
Mm-hmm. That's the point of the deload is to let fatigue dissipate, except there are times like right now, Nikki Sims competed last Saturday and she went nine for nine and she had a perfect meet day and she set PRs pretty much across the board. She she's Big squatted total. a little more once before, but it's the most she's ever squatted in like years and three or four years. Her deload is actually planned detraining. Right. I actually I actually planning the detraining right now. Like she can't keep chasing numbers right. for the next several weeks. So I don't deload her for a week or two weeks post meet where she goes nine for nine, hits all new PRs, and then back her off 10 or 20%. And here we go again. You, you, it's not sustainable long term. Right. And so right now, so she she's squatting up. She's she's going to be a three hundred pound squatter this year. So she's squatting in the high twos. And of course, you know she's got legs that are nine feet long, and she deadlifted four eighteen. And she left a bunch on the platform. We actually left a bunch on the platform across the board. But that was kind of the goal for this meet was to have a real good solid nine for nine meet. But it was still they were still PRs. It was all four eighteen was an all time PR on the deadlift, and she probably could have pulled like four twenty five four thirty that day. And so um, she had big PRs. She's squatting 185 this week, mm-hmm. and yeah. she's deadlifting uh, 185, 205, and 225 in that ballpark um, over, over three workouts. And um, she's, we're bringing the press back in. We dropped the press out for the few weeks. She actually did a powerlifting meet, so we're bringing the press back in. Uh, I mean, everything is like at 50%, yeah. literally 50% intensity. Now, will she get weaker from that? Yep. Am I okay with that? Yep. Because I, I'm gonna give her, I'm gonna give her joints a complete and total rest. I'm gonna let her completely dissipate fatigue, and then we're gonna start back in, and she's gonna start that MED process again, where she's gonna start doing LP. I told her I'm gonna move her to a four day split next week. So this week she did a full body three workouts. Next week she'll do the four day split. I'm running on LP. The weights are gonna be super easy for the next couple of weeks. We're just gonna get back the movement movement pattern and and get to feeling healthy again. And then we'll start ramping that thing back up. And then when we can't do LP anymore, we'll start to make the changes. We're good to go. So there are times when after a big giant cycle, 12, 16 week training cycle, you hit big PRs and an actual powerlifting meet, which by the way is different than hitting actual PRs in your home gym, no matter yep. what you think. Like there's still PRs, but there's a thing about the meet and doing it in front of everybody and the nerves and the stuff that just for I know we don't really uh, believe in saying burning out your CNS, but I don't know how to communicate it any other way. It's, it's just a stressful it's like, day. It's, it's like being in a day. car accident, right? Like, it's not just physical. Like, if you get in a bad car accident, one one that, you you know, like, you don't break bones and stuff. Rachel and I and the family were in a real bad car accident a few years ago. We, we hydroplaned in, in the Lexus and we in the SUV and spun around uh, and hit the hit the concrete median. It, it screws with your nervous system. It's not just we were sore and we were all we all had some whiplash and stuff, but there, there was something else. And, and that kind of, same kind of thing happens at a at a at a meet and so she gets a deload that is actually some plan d training and you didn't have that you don't have this like a little bit of ptsd post P, post pr <laughs> right and so you're getting a one week deload and then we're pushing right back into the heavy weights next week that's the goal so those are the difference between like an, a normal deload and like a what do i do after a meet sort of like where i had a great meet and i trained for it for a long time and i'm an advanced lifter like i hit the prs okay so those are those yeah. are two different things let's talk about that some more um so you, you're, she's going to she's going to detrain for a time and it's appropriate to do so pro- uh, probably i agree yeah. i would do the same thing i think so um due to all the things that happened in 2018 i really i just detrained from about the 4th of july until new year's eve Sure. You know, what are you going to do? It was life. This is what life. And last week I hit PRs on everything. And and, and and not just, like most of the lifts, I got a PR single and then backed off the same session and got a PR set of five on almost everything last week. Yeah. And <clears throat> I was talking to Trent about this yesterday. If I had trained hard all year last year, I don't know if my numbers would be higher today than they are as a result of laying off for three, four, five months yeah, and then hitting it hard. What do you think? That's weird. Yeah. I don't, man, I don't, I've I've experienced this myself. You come back from a long layoff. This is the amazing thing about it takes so long to build strength and hypertrophy in the first place. 
but and and I want to be really careful saying this because it's like one of those things where you don't want to give people uh, an excuse to not train or or to fuck around for a while. Yeah, I but think the reality the, is one of the yeah. keys is you've got to be pretty damn damn strong when you lay out. Yeah, you can't lay out before you're pretty damn strong or pretty yeah. damn big. And so you you did both, and then you didn't really like completely lay off. You were training, but it was like it was hard and it was sort of sporadic, and it would be two times one week and three times on another week and then once and then four times. It was just, you know, this sort of like, and at the very end of you selling the business, it was like not at all for three weeks or so. And then you started coming back and then you, and then you talked about to you and I talked about, you didn't understand, you didn't really, you couldn't comprehend the level of stress your job was causing you that is now not there. Yep. And so it, and it took a little while, right? Like you didn't just, uh, okay, it's over. And, uh, I sold the gym and, the money's in the bank and like there's no stress anymore like it that was sort of a process that seemed to take maybe six or eight weeks for you to sort of really like your stress four months well yeah but i yeah. and i watched i mean i just watched like every time i taught you you were a little more like less stressed a little more less curmudgeon -y. That's <laughs> and, not true. Uh, and um and so that so that changed some things and so yeah then you come back and now you're, you're coming back nothing aches nothing hurts joints are fine and now you get to, and you're not stressed, and training is about right. Also, it's a good time of year to train. This I this yeah. time to train in spring, especially for guys like you who train in your garage. Like you didn't have any training sessions where it was 105 outside. You didn't have any training sessions during this last cycle where it was you know below zero. And both those could potentially occur if you're training in your garage or or whatever. So, you know, you had no major family. Uh, I mean, you had some stuff with your parents, but you're. Um, you know, wife, kids, everybody's doing okay. So yeah. you're kind of in that position where you were coming out of this time of very little training and uh, started training again. And it just, I think you were primed at those PRs. And the question is, had you trained all the way through, would you have accumulated some of those little injuries and fatigue and joint issues and tendonitis and stuff where you just, you, the truthful answer is like, you probably could have hit one or two of those four PRs and you probably wouldn't have even approached the other two and not, and I don't have any idea what they are because I don't know if your hip hurts or your knee hurts or your elbows hurt or your shoulders hurt. I mean, you're old, so right. me too. Right. And so, um, so it, it'll be interesting to see. Like I'm kind of in a, a similar boat where I haven't trained. I didn't touch a barbell between six and eight weeks, and now for the last uh, three weeks, I've trained r real consistently. Haven't missed anything, and uh, I'm just doing LP. I'm doing a four day split LP is what I'm doing, and um, adding weight and adding weight and adding weight, and I go up about fifty pounds per lift per workout so mm -hmm. and so far i've been able to do that and uh just just switched to uh to an intermediate uh incremental increase on upper body so instead of going 50 pounds i'm doing about a 25 pound jump right now on my bench press and my and my presses and so uh bench press 315 yesterday for a few reps and um you know not there yet but getting there deadlifted my deadlift is up to 405 by five real easy 405 yep. by five is fine i'll do 455 tomorrow and I'll do 495 uh, first part of next week. You told me, um, you said that you thought, earlier you said you thought you had programmed 405 for five for me. You actually programmed it for a triple. Dude, I couldn't have got four. Oh, really? I did, yeah, I did yeah. last night. I couldn't have done it. And, and uh, based on my programming, I pulled 500 last week. And what, the way my programming was going, the way the way the, my performance had been and the way the programming had been, I – went in the gym and I'm like, I'm going to double 500. There's no fucking question in my mind. I'm going to double 500. Yeah. But, but I was so beat up. It took me about eight seconds to lock out a single. Yeah. Like Yahtzee, that's it. That was it. That was it. Yeah. But and it maybe, and it may be a little while before you pull 500 again. So hopefully we can get you back there. Well, in I don't know. A month or so, but if, I, if, if we dissipate this stress, like you're talking about, like yep. it, it, there's a good chance that maybe a week from Friday, yep, I uh, that I could, that I could pull a double, uh, at, at 500. Now, yep. I don't know if that's the best thing for me to do at this point. Probably, sure. probably not. Um, but th the main thing for me has been, I've had to recalibrate my head and, and really not look at the numbers and to trust the programming and just go in there and just do the work just to do the work. We just did a show about that. And, uh, and that, that loomed large for me earlier this week, man, I'm still beat up, man. Yeah. <laughs> this deload shit is going to have to come together here in the next few days. Cause I am still beat. Yeah, I've got up. another, uh, another client who's a starting strength coach, Harry, Harry mm -hmm. Fafutis, um, one of our Mexican connection. And he's doing a deload and, uh, 
one of the things I always want to hear from my clients, I was telling him, uh, on that first workout of the deload, I want him to go like, oh, that was so heavy. And I was like, bro, we, you know, we backed it off 20%. And mm -hmm. I, that's how you know the deload is right. Yeah. It's like that Wednesday day. Like when you start taking that first Wednesday light day and you're like, how could I back this off 20% and it'd still be so damn heavy? Like, well, because the fatigue was there and needs to dissipate. It's the same thing, only we're just, it's not a day anymore. It's an entire week. And so, and then you'll watch if you do it right. And a one week deload is the right amount of time. That first week is real. That first workout is real heavy. And they feel like crap. And that second week, they also feel like crap. And second day, they also feel like crap. And then they take a, usually a day off, like on Wednesday. And then they come back on Thursday and they're like, okay, I'm still pretty beat up. But I, and then the last workout of the week, they feel quite a bit better. And then if they do it where I like my clients to train like on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday or something like that, and they get all the Saturday off and all the Sunday yeah. off and they come back Monday and they're like, all right, I feel pretty good now. And actually, normally they'll come back on that Monday after the deload and they feel a little bit stale. Hmm. So I, I really don't know if the workout, if the deload worked well until the second workout back after the deload. That's another one of my, I don't know that I've ever said that or verbalized that, but it's, it's, I've noticed that, that, you know, it's not very heavy. It's not very heavy. There's there maybe even as a, a little bit of potentially detraining going on or mental thing, or you're just not used Certainly to the mental, you haven't had the heavy weight. Mm -hmm. And so it, it stale is probably the right word. You just feel a little stale and you come back. And especially if that's a lower body workout, you come in and you do your squats and deadlifts on Monday. I like, think Oof. we become, um, the vocabulary is tough. There's so many words that have been poisoned in like all the debates about programming and stuff. Yeah. Um, uh, but particularly for the press for me, I have to become desensitized to having the heavy weight in my hands. Yeah. Like I might be strong enough to press 220 on a given day, but if I take it out of the rack and it feels heavy, it's just yeah, not going to happen. Yeah. So I have to have a lot of practice so that I become numb to the fact that it's <laughs> that it's 100 kilos in my hands, you know. Yeah, there's something about the press for me too that when I haven't handled heavy weight, it seems to be um, the last thing to come back. Yeah. You know, um, I think that if I took, I think that at this point, as much as I've trained over the last 20 years, I could take a I could take a month off, six weeks off, eight weeks off, and if if you held a, a gun to my kid's head and were like, hey, you got to deadlift six hundred after not doing anything for two months, I think I could deadlift six hundred. Now I'm I would never actually do that, and if I ever tried it without a gun to my kid's head after two months, I I would miss it. But like if I absolutely had to, right, and I had some like fight or flight syndrome sort of stuff going on, and I actually fought. But I think if you put 225 in my hands or 245 in my hands on a press, and my all-time best press is you know over 300, a little over 300, and you did that and held a gun to my kid's head, ends bad for them. <laughs> Sorry, honey, daddy was weak today. Because there, you're right. There's something about that bar in your hands, in front of your body when you take it off. You're just like, you know, so it takes a little longer. It seems like to uh, to work that press back up. Um, it's also the first thing that's affected for me by uh, weight loss or gain when i lose weight my press hits the shitter when i gain weight my press gets real strong whereas right. the deadlift is kind of the opposite like the the leaner i get and that's a in air quotes leaner because <laughs> i don't ever really ever get that lean but when i'm pretty Le lean for me lean for you my deadlift continues to get better not worse now, obviously there's a at some point there's a lot of diminishing returns there and you can get so small and so lean and lose 70 pounds it's probably going to go down but you'll see that these guys that some of the best deadlifters of all time are 198, 220, 242. If you look at those records at 198, 220, 242, they will, they will compare nicely with the 275s, which, is, which has been consistently the strongest weight class in all of powerlifting, and they'll, they'll far surpass, their deadlifts will surpass the guys who are 308s and super heavyweights. And, um, and that's, you know, you just – it's getting the belly out of the way. Your leverages actually get better on a deadlift since it's starting from a dead stop at the bottom. Right. Whereas as those guys lose weight, uh, they just lose tightness in the squat and the bench press and the press. And so being able to get some more air in and set your back a little better as you get lighter seems to help. Oh, my gosh. I want to talk a little bit here about – so we're talking about these de de these deloads. And I've got – four or five older guys that I have running essentially the same program. It's all changed up for each of them. It's tweaked, but the bones of the thing are the same. They're on a four day split. They have a heavy day and a light day for each of the lifts. And they're accruing all their work over the course of four weeks. 
So they're getting some kind of PR about about once a month for each of the lifts. And uh, all of these guys have been with me a long time. You've heard you've heard some of them on the show. You've heard Sean Richardson on yep. the show. Uh, you've heard me talk about Tim Peterson. I've got another guy named Jason and a couple of others. And these guys have been with me a long time. You know, Sean's been with us for since 2015, I think. Uh, Tim's almost the same. And, so, and, and, and these guys never miss a workout. Right. So they're, they're advanced lifters. You know, no matter what their numbers are, these guys are advanced lifters and they do their darn work. And I've got these guys doing 18 to 21 work sets a session four times a week. Mm. Mm. And I was like, I, f- I was feeling bad about it. I'm like, God, these are older gentlemen. <laughs> you know, this ain't great. So I called a little consult. I talked to Andy about it, talked to Andrew about it, had Andrew do a screen share and we looked at it and he's like, yeah, that's, you know, if they want to keep getting stronger, that's probably where they need to be. Yep. So their first week, um, in general, let's say they're going to do lots of five by fives. They're going to do lots of triples for their, yep. for their heavies, like three triples would be their heavy, would be their heavy day in Texas method. It might be one five, right? But for these guys, it might be three triples. And yep. then their light day is going to be five fives in all of it's pretty darn heavy. The yep. next week it's, it's kind of the same heavier yet. Yep. The third week kind of deloaded. It's lighter yeah, right. than the first week. And then the fourth week, they, they should get PRs of some type, either for reps or for sets or something on everything. And I, I'm just trying with these older guys to just not get them fatigued. Yep. And so I'm giving them a, some sort of a deload. And it's not, you know, it's not a deload as deep as the one you've given me. But sure. I'm trying, and, and they've, I, I see, we seem to be able to kind of, kind of, Kind of feather stay the gas pedal here. Yeah, you you kind of stay ahead of the fatigue is what you're doing. So one of the things I was gonna I was gonna mention. I think you've basically just done is the difference between planned deloads and unplanned deloads. Mm-hmm. And I've I've kind of I, I I use both my clients. I've waffled back and forth over the years. I used to do planned deloads all the time, and that really came from reading about the the Eastern Bloc countries that would over the course of their yearly cycle or as they went towards a especially international level meets like Pan Am games, you know, in one two year cycle and then the Olympics in the next two year cycle or whatever, they would actually plan, you know, three weeks of loading followed by a week of deload, three weeks of loading followed right. by a week of deload. And then they would do two weeks of loading followed by two weeks of deload or Ooh. two and one. And as they went into the actual Olympics, they would do like a week of loading followed by two weeks of deload. I think the Romanians even might have done three weeks. And now their deload was Still real damn heavy, sure. Um, just less volume and, and still fairly high frequency because the Eastern Bloc guys always do that. But um, so I would do that, and and one of the problems I have with templates in general is that it you're just you're just sort of shooting at the bell curve with the template, right? So like right. where the middle of the bell curve. Well, most guys seem to do pretty well with three weeks on and then a week of deload. Now I. I I have clients that I've trained now so long, like with Brett McKay, I know how long Brett can train before he needs a deload. Brett can actually normally do four weeks and a deload. So we, mm-hmm. we kind of generally keep that in mind. So he can train for four weeks and then he needs a deload week and then four weeks and then a deload week. And a lot of my clients like you can do usually more like three weeks and a deload. Somewhere. And it depends on how much stress there is during the loading phase as well. But I've, I've gotten more and more to the, I can just feel the thing out. If I'm, as a coach, if I'm seeing every rep of all their work sets, in online coaching or in person, I can start to see when that bar slows down. I can start to see yep. when they grind. And I can tell the difference between just a hard workout or even a bad workout, a day that just went bad for whatever reason. They come back the next day, and they're perfectly fine. Uh, and it, it may be completely different lifts. Like, okay, this isn't like a systemic problem at this point. It's just like you had a bad day or like maybe your back is fatigued, and then you get to upper body, and upper body's fine. And I start to feel that stuff out and go, okay, like I can see a deload is coming. And then there's also times when I'll have to go, man, this guy's got a couple more sessions in him. So I did this with Father Floater not very long ago where he was just about ready for a deload, but it wasn't quite there. And I was like, man, another another week is going to grind this guy into powder of yeah. loading. But a deload right now is going to actually be a little too early. And so then I ended up having – I just like threw – everything I could at him the first two sessions that week, like on Monday and Tuesday. And then I deloaded, deloaded him on Wednesday or Thursday and Friday and then gave him another full week deload afterwards. I just didn't have to deload him as hard in that next space. Because again, what are we trying to do? We're just like, you're just trying to dissipate the fatigue right? without allowing detraining. If it's just dissipate, dissipate fatigue, you just tell the guy to sit on the couch and eat potato chips. 
Right. But he still has to train. Otherwise, there's detraining. So now, Nikki theoretically could have sat on the couch and ate, ate potato chips. Why do I have her go back? Like, she actually did her first training session on Monday after the meet on Saturday. Why? Because she has uh, exercise bulimia? <laughs> no, it's not because she has exercise bulimia. Oh. As a matter of fact, she probably would have rather taken the day off. Right. It's because because Darren Deaton says motion is lotion. Right. And when you're beat up and things hurt and joints hurt and you're even potentially bruised in places, I actually just want to get you moving. I don't really even care how much weight there is that first day back. That's why that's why I set the weights at like 45, 50% of what they hit at the meet. Like it's low, but we're going to get some reps in and we're going to get some blood pumped in because you, my goal at the end of session one and session two after a meet is to actually feel better at the end. You get done and you're like, I actually feel better than I did when I started. Um, and so that's that's the goal there. And so only that, thing that's, that why makes... I have, that's why that's why that's why I almost never send somebody to just like sit on the couch and eat potato chips. Now, if they're going on vacation and they tell me ahead of time, like, hey, I'm gonna go on vacation, I'm not gonna train for a week, which is great. I got no problem right. with that. You know, yeah. if you if you train consistently, you got high compliance, you never miss workouts, and you're going on vacation. What I'll do is I'll I'll ramp you up real heavy and lots of stress going into the vacation. And then I'll say, hey, man, just go drink margaritas and eat good food on the vacation. Lay out on the beach. I got no problem with that. Don't touch a weight. And that works just fine, too. And there's not much detraining that occurs. And actually, the detraining probably occurs more from the high alcohol consumption than it right. does from the lack of lifting. Poisoning um, your body. So there's lots of ways. The, the point of, the, of this episode, I think, is that there are actually lots of ways to deload. And there are times when we're actually trying to, to – we're, we're using the deload to get different – effects like we're actually trying to get different adapt adaptations from that deload so for you i'm just trying to dissipate the fatigue not detrain come back yep. next week basically do about what you did maybe two or three weeks ago next week and then by two weeks after your deload you're ramping up to either all-time highs or close to all-time highs and that doesn't necessarily mean singles it might mean all-time highs at fives or triples or whatever whereas with somebody like nikki who just did a you know a 14-week cycle and she's coming out of a powerlifting meet. I actually have a, her deload is actually a plan D training, and it's okay. And yep. we'll focus on hypertrophy and let her feel good and not chase numbers and kind of give her brain a rest and just enjoy. There are times when training needs to be fun. If you've ever trained for a meet, like a no shit meet where you're an advanced lifter and you've actually trained for 12 or 14 weeks, I mean, 16 straight weeks of chasing numbers, you cannot chase numbers after the meet. Whether it went well or not, whether you hit PRs or not, like you've got to have a you mental can try. break from that. You can try it, and you're not gonna you're not gonna do it. Yeah, gonna and at the one. end, there it's very rare that training is fun going into a meet for an advanced lifter. It's work. Yeah. Like, it's like going it's like going to a job that you don't want to go to. Like a, you wake up, you know, dream about it the night before, uh, and it's not like exciting. It's not like when you're an LP and you're dreaming about hitting PRs. Like you're dreaming about shit. I got to do. I got to do you know six sets of three at 88% of my deadlift. <laughs> it sucks, man. Yeah. <laughs> so nobody wants to do that. Nobody gets excited about six sets of three, 88%. And so um, when the meet gets over for somebody like Nikki, we need to make training. Let's, you know, we're making, we're, we're making training fun again. That's what we're doing. And oh, uh, we could yeah. put that on a hat, put it on a hat. We, uh, I, I pulled that 500, you know, it's like, I had a dream. You're talking about dreaming about it. Like I, I, I had a dream that I pulled it for two. Cause I knew that I should have been able to pull it for two. And uh, and I got out there, and I'm like, I'm not pulling this on my fucking clown bar. I'm going to get my 40 millimeter, like my super stiff, like, you know, I, I did it on B&R bar. <laughs> and uh, if I had used use my uh, uh, Oki deadlift bar, I, I definitely would have pulled it for two. But, I, yeah, you were talking about dreaming about it. I definitely was. I was preoccupied by it. I bought a new barbell. We needed another power bar. We needed another, uh, you know, center neural bar. Yeah. And... Uh, there were, there were several bars I could have bought, of course. Yep. And, and I bought an Oki Power Bar. Did you? Okay. Yeah. Ricky Dale Cranes in Shawnee, Oklahoma. He's from Oklahoma. I'm like, I don't have one of those. They're legendary. I should have one of those. Okay. So bought one. Came in yesterday. Uh, here's my review. It's chrome. They didn't used to be chrome. They used to be raw steel. Yeah. Uh, it's chrome, uh, but they chromed the bar before before they knurled it. So the the knurling isn't all filled in, and you yeah. know. It, so the yeah. knurl, the knurling's really good. Have you have you have you used the Rogue West Side bar? Yes, I would say the knurling is just this Sim side of that. 
Because that that, that this ro- side of that mean that it's, what does that it's mean? softer than that. It's in between like a softer. BNR bar and the West okay. Side bar, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which I actually like very very much for my squat because the bar I have a hard time keeping the goddamn bar on my back. So that yeah. I think this is going to be my squat bar. It's a twenty eight and a half millimeter bar. Um, man, they've been making them the same way for f- almost forty years. There are no bushings. Yeah, it's just a steel collar on a steel bar. Spins fine. It's not an Olympic bar. It's not. So it's not bearing and not bushing? Are you no. sure? Well, yeah. Then, well, there's the Oki the deadlift bar. It just spins. I mean, there's I a little understand. oil. There's a little oil in there. It makes no sense to me. Well, I mean, it just doesn't spin as freely. You don't want to do power cleans with this bar. Sure, but it's not designed for that. Sure. Well, there's some more talk about deloads. You know, you talk about there are several different reasons why someone might deload. One might be after a after a meet, in which case you actually want to give them a great deal of rest. It's not about dissipating fatigue. It's really about resting the organism so they don't die. And yep. in your example of Nikki, you're going to get her to move again, just because the only thing that makes squatting soreness go away is more squatting. So you're going to get her in there and get her to move again, but you're going to give her whole body a rest for maybe several, several months. And advanced lifters, I think have to do that. They can only be at their best for a few weeks a year, uh, or maybe even one day a year. And then in my case, uh, you're letting fatigue dissipate because we believe that I should probably have several more, several more PRs in me over the course of this year. And, um, we're just letting that, letting that dissipate. And one of the worst things about getting a PR, Matt, is that means that everything gets heavier. Your reward for getting a PR is, is that you get your rump kicked harder. Uh, yeah. The D load gets harder. The D load is heavier for sure. Yeah. Uh, takes more work. I mean, takes more work to keep making progress. So, uh, that's the downside. And also why you can sort of get a reset. You can sort of play that game with post meet with somebody like Nikki, like I was talking about, we, we can kind of do a reset there and, and a slowly build work capacity back up and some volume and some hypertrophy and do some things she's wanting to focus on, uh, before we start chasing numbers again and then start to convert over and chase those numbers. So it's, it's just a nice, uh, it's a nice reset there. You're not ready for it yet. We're going to keep chasing some PRs for you. Uh, keep chasing numbers here over the next couple months while stress is relatively low. And when life throws you a curveball, we'll back it off and uh, do the best we can. Yeah, I may have to take it easy on those shoulders, man. I'll tell you that. Those presses are killing me. I've yeah. been, been benching Again, very heavy. You know, we talked about in the episode with Christy, like you're so kyphotic. <laughs> yeah. It's a... Uh, those presses for those people with kyphosis is uh, is difficult. We ought to play around with some uh, incline press for you a little bit and see if incline press hurts your shoulders more or less than a standing press. So, well, uh, and get your deloads in when you need it. Uh, I wouldn't plan them ahead of time, at least in the beginning. I don't think it's the right thing to do. Once you've been training long enough and you kind of get the idea of how hard you're going to train, uh, like I said, a guy like Brett, for the most part, is going to be able to train about four weeks of, of loading followed by a week of deload. You can't handle quite four weeks of loading. I've got to do, put you more at three, but even you, I don't tend to plan them. I just uh, let you train until you start getting beat up and start slowing down, and then I back the thing off and – give you some recovery and go from there. And then after a meet, man, have some fun, make fun, make training fun again and uh, get in the gym and do some stuff you enjoy. It doesn't always have to be crazy chasing numbers, intensity, especially if you've already gotten strong. Now, if you haven't gotten strong, you got to do your work, you got to eat your groceries, you got to do your LP, you got to put more weight on the bar, you got to get strong first. Uh, But once you're at the point that you're sort of late, intermediate, advanced and beyond post meet, enjoy yourself. If you can't get to the gym every once, like half of the year, if you're not really enjoying yourself in the in the gym six months out of the year, you're doing it wrong. Uh, you should look forward to the training and not just the competition. There is another Barbell Logic podcast. Uh, come for the barbells. Get an earful about Soylent Green, AI, oligarchs, and barbells. Uh, please go to iTunes and give us a five-star review, as always, and send this to one of your friends. Uh, send your questions, by the way, to questions at barbell-logic.com, and we'll throw those in on a future question and answer show. Thank yeah, you so much. Yeah, we're getting to those, but holy crap, we're not answering as many as we're having coming in. I thought, well, we'll stay on top of this thing. Like, well, no, there's now there's 85 questions, and we've already answered about 60 of them on the on Q and A episodes. So I'm, a, you know, so if we knock out five or six questions, what we need to do is maybe set up on those Q and A episodes and do like uh, actually set a timer. And answer like the first two in four minutes per answer. Kind of set those up like the most important ones, and then rapid fire thirty seconds per answer for like the next ten. The only I don't do anything rapid. All right, guys, that's another show. Talk to you soon. 